Oh, damn it. Oof, what a trip. Welcome to my talk on hacking the new Nintendo Game & Watch Super Mario Bros. My name is Thomas Roth and I'm a security researcher and trainer from Germany and you can find me on Twitter at Ghidra Ninja and also on YouTube at StacksMachine. Now this year marks the 35th anniversary of our favorite plumber, Super Mario. And to celebrate that, Nintendo launched a new game console called the Nintendo Game & Watch Super Mario Bros. The console is lightweight and looks pretty nice and it comes pre-installed with three games and also this nice animated clock. The three games are Super Mario Bros. the original NES game, Super Mario Bros. 2 the Lost Levels and also a reinterpretation of an old Game & Watch game called Ball. Now as you probably know, this is not the first retro console that Nintendo released. In 2016 they released the NES Classic and 2017 they released the SNES Classic. Now these devices were super popular in the homebrew community because they make it really easy to add additional ROMs to it, they make it really easy to modify the firmware and so on, and you can basically just plug them into your computer, install a simple software and you can do whatever you want with them. The reason for that is that they run Linux and have, uh, and have a pretty powerful ARM processor on the inside and so it's really it's really a nice uh, device to play with and so on. And so when Nintendo announced this new console, a lot of people were hoping for a similar experience of having a nice mobile homebrew device. Now, if you were to make a Venn diagram of some of my biggest interests, you would have reverse engineering, hardware hacking and retro computing. And this new game at Watch fits right in the middle of that. And so when it was announced on the 3rd of September, I knew that I needed to have one of those. And given how hard the NES and the SNES Classic were to buy for a while, I pre-ordered it on like four or five different sites, uh, a couple of which got cancelled. But um, I was pretty excited because I had three pre-orders and it was supposed to ship on the 13th of November. And so I was really looking forward to this. And I was having breakfast on the 12th of November when suddenly the doorbell rang and DHL delivered me the new Game & Watch one day before the official release. Now at that point in time, there was no technical information available about the device whatsoever. Like if you uh, searched for Game & Watch on Twitter, you would only find the announcements or maybe a picture of the box of someone who also received it early. But there were no teardowns, no pictures of the insides and most importantly, nobody hacked, had hacked it yet. And this gave me, as a hardware hacker, the kind of unique opportunity to potentially be the first one to hack a new Nintendo console. And so I just literally dropped everything else I was doing and started investigating the device. Now, I should say that normally I stay pretty far away from any new console hacking. 
um, mainly because of the piracy issues. I don't want to enable piracy. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to deal with piracy, and I don't want to build tools that enable other people to pirate stuff, basically. But given that on this device you cannot buy any more games, and that all the games that are on there were basically already released over 30 years ago, I was not really worried about piracy and felt pretty comfortable in sharing all the results of the investigation and uh, also the basically the issues we found that allowed us to customize the device and so on. And in this talk, I want to walk you through how we managed to hack the device and how you can do it at home using relatively cheap hardware. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Now, let's start by looking at the, at the device itself. The device is pretty lightweight and comes with a nicely sized case. And so it, it really, um, for me, it sits really well in my hand and it has a nice 320 by 240 LCD display, a D-pad, A and B buttons, and also three buttons to switch between the different game modes. On the right side, we also have the power button and the USB-C port. Now, before you get excited about the USB port, I can already tell you that unfortunately, Nintendo decided to not connect the data lines of the USB port, and so you can really only use it for charging. Also, because we are talking about Nintendo here, they use their proprietary tripoint screws uh, on the device, and so to open it up, you need one of those special tripoint bits. Um, luckily, nowadays, most bit sets should have them, but it still um, it would suck if you order your unit and then you can't open it up because you're missing a screwdriver. After opening it up, the first thing you probably notice is the battery. And if you've ever opened up a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con before, you might recognize the battery because it's the exact same one that's used in the Joy-Cons. This is very cool because if down the line, like let's say in two or three years, your battery of your Game & Watch dies, you can just go and buy a Joy-Con battery, which you can have really cheaply uh, almost anywhere. Next to the battery on the right side, we have um, a small speaker, which is not very good. <laughs> and underneath we have the main PCB with the processor, the storage and so on and so forth. Let's take a look at those. Now the main processor of the device is an STM32H7B0. This is a Cortex-M7 uh, from ST Microelectronics with 1.3 megabytes of RAM and 128 kilobytes of flash. It runs at 280 MHz and is a pretty beefy microcontroller. But it's much less powerful than the processor in the NES or SNES Classic. Like this processor is really just a microcontroller and so it can't run Linux, it can't run, um, let's say, super complex software. Instead, it will, be, it will be programmed in some bare metal way. And so we will have a bare metal firmware on the device. To the right of it, you can also find a one megabyte SPI flash um, and so overall, we have roughly 1.1 megabyte of storage on the device. Now, most microcontrollers, or basically all microcontrollers, have a debugging port. And if we take a look at the PCB, you can see that there are five unpopulated contacts here. And if you see a couple of contacts that are not populated close to your CPU, it's very likely that, um, that it's the debugging port. And luckily, the data sheet for the STM32 is openly available. And so we can check the pinouts in the data sheet and then use a multimeter to, um, to see whether these pins are actually the debugging interface. And it turns out they actually are. And so we can find the SWD debugging interface as well as VCC and ground exposed on these pins. Now, this means that we can use a debugger, so for example, a J-Link or an ST-Link or whatever, to connect to the device. And because the, the contacts are really easy to access, you don't even have to solder. Like You can just hook up a couple of test pins and they will allow you to, to easily um, hook up your debugger. Now, the problem is, on most devices, the debugging interface will be locked during manufacturing. This is done to prevent people like us to basically do whatever with the device and to prevent us from being able to dump the firmware, uh, potentially reflash it and so on. And so I was very curious to see whether we can actually connect to the debugging port. And when starting up JLink and trying to connect, we can see it can actually successfully connect. But when you take a closer look, there's also a message that the device is active read protected. This is because the chip 
the STM32 chip features something called RDP protection level or readout protection level. This is basically the, the security setting for the debugging interface and it has three levels. Level zero means no protection is active. Level one means that the flash memory is protected and so we can't dump the internal flash of the device. Uh, however, we can dump the RAM contents and we can also execute code from RAM. And then there's also level two, which means that all debugging features are disabled. Now, just because a chip is in level two doesn't mean that you have to give up. For example, in our talk wallet.fail a couple of years ago, we showed how to use fault injection to bypass the level two protection and downgrade a chip to level one. However, on the game and watch, we are lucky and the interface is not fully disabled. Instead, it's in level one and so we can still dump the RAM, which is a pretty good entry point, even though uh, we can't dump the firmware yet. Now, having dumped the RAM of the device, I was pretty curious to see what's inside of it. And one of my suspicions was that potentially the emulator that's hopefully running on the device it loads the original Super Mario Brothers ROM into RAM. And so I was wondering whether maybe we can find the ROM that the device uses in the RAM dump. And so I open up the RAM dump in a, in a hex editor, and I also open up the original Super Mario Brothers ROM in a second window in a hex editor, and try to find different parts of the original ROM in the RAM dump. And it turns out that yes, the NES ROM is loaded into RAM, and it's always at the same address. And so it's probably like during boot up, it gets copied into RAM uh, or something along those lines. And so this is pretty cool to know because it tells us a, a couple of things. First off, we know now that the debug port is enabled and working, but that it's unfortunately at RDP level one. And so we can only dump the, the RAM. And we also know that the NES ROM is loaded into RAM. And this means that the device runs a real NES emulator. And so if we get lucky, we can, for example, just replace the ROM that is used by the, by the device and play, for example, our own NES game. <clears throat> Next was time to dump the flash chip of the device. For this, I'm using a device called Mini Pro, and I'm using one of these really useful SOIC 8 clips. And so these ones you can simply clip onto the flash chip and then dump it. Now, one warning though, the flash chip on the device is running at 1.8 volts. And so you wanna make sure that your programmer also supports 1.8 volt operation. If you accidentally try to read it out at 3.3 volts, you will break your flash. Trust me, because it happened to me on one of my units. Now, with this flash dump from the device, we can start to analyze it. And what I always like to do first is take a look at the entropy or the randomness of the flash dump. And so using binwalk with the dash uppercase E option, we get a nice entropy graph. And in this case, you can see we have a very high entropy over almost the whole flash contents. And this mostly indicates that the flash contents are encrypted. It could also mean compression, but if it's compressed, you would often see more like dips in the entropy. And in this case, it's one very high entropy stream. We also notice that there are no repetitions whatsoever which also tells us that it's probably not like a simple XOR-based encryption or so, and instead something like AES or, or something similar. But just because the flash is encrypted doesn't mean we have to give up. On the contrary, I think now it starts to get interesting because you actually have a challenge and it's not just plug and, plug and play, so to say. One of the biggest questions I had is, is the flash actually verified? Like, does the device boot even though the flash has been modified? Because if it does, this would open up a lot of uh, attack vectors, basically, as you will see. And so to, to verify this, I basically try to put zeros in random places in the flash image. And so I put some at address zero, some at hex 2000 and so on. And then I checked whether the device would still boot up. And with most flash modifications, it would still boot just fine. This tells us that even though the flash contents are encrypted, they are not validated, they are not checksumed or anything, and so the device, and so we can potentially trick the device into accepting a modified flash image. And this is really important to know, as you will see in a couple of minutes. My next suspicion was that maybe the NES ROM we see in RAM is actually loaded from the external flash. 
And so to, to find out whether that's the case, I again took the flash and I inserted zeros at multiple positions in the flash image, flashed that over, booted up the game, dumped the RAM, and then compared the NES ROM that I'm now dumping from RAM with the one that I dumped initially and checked whether they are equal. Because my suspicion was that maybe I can, um, I can overwrite a couple of bytes in the encrypted flash and then I will modify the NES ROM. And after doing this for like, I don't know, half an hour, I got lucky and I modified four bytes in the flash image and four bytes in the RAM, uh, sorry, in the ROM that was loaded into RAM changed. And this tells us quite a bit. It means that the ROM is loaded from flash into RAM and that the, the flash contents are not validated. And what's also important is that we, we changed four bytes in the flash and now four bytes in the decrypted image changed. And this is very important to know because if we take a look at what we would expect to happen when we, when we change the flash contents, there are multiple outcomes. And so for example, here we have the spy flash contents on the left and the RAM contents on the right. And so the RAM contents are basically the decrypted version of the spy flash contents. Now let's say we change four bytes in the encrypted flash image to zeros. How would we expect the RAM contents to change? For example, if we would see that now 16 bytes in the RAM are changing, this means that we are potentially looking at uh, an encryption algorithm such as AES in electronic codebook mode because it's a block-based encryption and so if we change four bytes in the input data, a block size, in this case 16 bytes, in the output data would change. The next possibility is that we change four bytes in the spy flash and all data afterwards uh, will be changed. And in this case, we would look at some kind of chaining cipher, such as AES in the CBC mode. However, if we change four bytes in the spy flash and only four bytes in the RAM changed, we are looking at, at something such as AES in counter mode. And to understand this, let's take a better look at how AES in CTR works. AES CTR works by having your clear text and XORing it with an AES encryption stream that is generated from a key, a nonce, and a counter algorithm. Now the AES stream that will be used to XOR your clear text will always be the same if key and nonce is the same. This is why it's super important that if you use AES CTR, you always select a unique nonce for each encryption. If you encrypt similar data with the same nonce twice, large parts of the resulting ciphertext will be the same. And so the clear text gets XORed with the AES CTR stream, and then we get our ciphertext. Now, if we know the clear text as we do, because the clear text is the ROM that is loaded into RAM, and we know the ciphertext, which we do because it's the contents of the encrypted flash we just dump, we can basically you reverse the operation and as a result we get the AES CTR stream that was used to encrypt the flash. And now this means that we can take for example a custom ROM, XOR it with the AES CTR stream we just calculated and then generate our own encrypted flash image for example with a modified ROM. And so I wrote a couple of Python scripts to, to try this and after a while I was running hacked Super Mario Brothers instead of Super Mario Brothers. So woohoo, we hacked the Nintendo Game & Watch one day before the official release and we can install modified Super Mario Brothers ROMs. Now you can find the scripts that I used for this on my GitHub, so it's in a repository called Game & Watch Hacking. And I was super excited because it, mean, it meant that I succeeded and that I basically hacked a Nintendo console one day before the official release. Unfortunately, I finished the level, but Toad wasn't ex as excited. He told me that unfortunately our firmware is still in another castle. And so on the Monday, after the launch of the device, I teamed up with Conrad Beckman, a hardware hacker from Sweden who I met at the previous Congress. And we started chatting and throwing ideas back and forth and so on. And eventually we noticed that the device has a special RAM area called ITCM RAM which is a tightly coupled instruction RAM 
that is normally used for very high performance routines such as interrupt handlers and so on. And so it's in a very fast RAM area. And we realized that we never actually looked at the contents of that ITCM RAM. And so we dumped it from the device using the debugging port and it turns out that this ITCM RAM contains ARM code. And so again, the question is, where does this ARM code come from? Does it maybe, just like the NES ROM, come from the external flash? And so um, basically, I repeated the whole, um, the whole thing that we also did with the NES ROM, and it just put zeros at the very beginning of the encrypted flash, rebooted the device, and dumped the ITCM ROM and I got super lucky. On the first try already, uh, the ITCM contents changed. And because the ITCM contains code, not just data, so earlier we only had the, the NES ROM, which is just data, but this time the RAM contains code. This means that with the same XOR trick we used before, we could inject custom ITCM code into the external flash, which would then be loaded into RAM when the device boots. And because um, it's, it's a persistent method, we can then reboot the device and let it run without the debugger connected. And so whatever code we load into this ITCM area will be able to actually read the flash. And so we could potentially write some code that gets somehow called by the firmware and then copies the internal flash into RAM from where we then can uh, retrieve it using the debugger. Now the problem is, let's say we have a custom payload in somehow in this ITCM area. We don't know which address of this ITCM code gets executed. And so we don't know whether the firmware will jump to address 0 or address 200 or whatever. But there's a really simple trick to still build a successful payload and it's called a knob slide. A knob or no operation is an instruction that simply does nothing. And if we fill most of the ITCM RAM with knobs and put our payload at the very end, we build something that is basically a knob slide. And so when the CPU, um, indicated by Mario here, jumps to a random address in that whole knob slide, it will start executing knobs, 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 and slide down into our payload and execute it. And so even if Mario jumps right in the middle of the knob slide, he will always slide down the slide and end up in our payload. And Conrad wrote this really, really simple payload, which is only like 10 instructions, which basically just copies the internal flash into RAM from where we can then retrieve it using the debugger. So woohoo, super simple exploit. We have a full firmware backup and a full flash backup, and now we can really fiddle with everything on the device. And we've actually released tools uh, to do this yourself. And so if you want to backup your Nintendo Game & Watch, you can just go um, onto my GitHub and download the Game & Watch backup repository, which contains uh, a lot of information on how to back it up. It does, um, it does check something and so on to ensure that you don't accidentally break your device. And you can easily back up the original firmware, install Homebrew, and then always go back to the original uh, software. We also have an awesome support community on Discord. And so if you ever need help, you you will um, I think you will find success there. And so far, we haven't had a single bricked game and watch, and so looks to be pretty stable. And so I was pretty excited because uh, the quest was over, or is it? If you ever claim on the internet that you successfully hacked an embedded device, there will be exactly one response and one response only. But does it run Doom? Literally, my Twitter DMs, my YouTube comments, and even my friends were spamming me with the challenge to get Doom running on the device. But to get Doom running, we first needed to bring up all the hardware. And so we basically needed to create a way to develop and load Homebrew onto the device. Now, luckily for us, most of the components on the board are very well documented. And so there are no NDA components. And so, for example, the processor has an open reference manual and open source library to use it. The flash is a well-known flash chip and so on and so forth. And there are only a couple of very proprietary or custom components. And so, for example, the LCD on the device 
is proprietary and we had to basically sniff the SPI bus that goes to the display um, to basically decode the, the initialization of the, of the display and so on. And after a while, we had the full hardware running. We had LCD support, we had audio support, sleep support buttons, and even flashing tools that allow you to simply use an SWD debugger to dump and rewrite the external flash. And you can find all of these things on our GitHub. Now, if you want to mod your own game and watch, all you need is a simple debugging adapter, such as a cheap $3 ST-Link, a J-Link, or, uh, or a real ST-Link device, and then you can get started. We've also published a base project for anyone who wants to get started with building their own games for the game and watch. And so it's really simple. It's just a frame buffer you can draw to, input is really simple and so on. And as said, we have a really helpful community. Now with all the hardware up and running, I could finally start porting Doom. Now I started by looking around for other ports of Doom to an STM32. And I found this project by Floppis called STM32Doom. Now the issue is STM32Doom is designed for a board with 8 megabytes of RAM. And also the data files for Doom were stored on an external USB drive. On our platform, we only have 1.3 megabytes of RAM, 128 kilobytes of flash, and only one megabyte of external flash. And we have to fit all the level information, all the code and so on in there. Now the Doom level information is stored in so-called WAD, what, where's all my data files. And these data files contain the sprites, the textures, the levels, and so on. Now the what for Doom 1 is roughly 4 megabytes in size, and the what for Doom 2 is 14 megabytes in size. But we only have 1.1 megabyte of storage, plus we have to fit all the code in there. So obviously we needed to find a very, very small Doom Watt. And as it turns out, there's a thing called Mini Watt, which is a minimal Doom iWatt, which is basically all the bells and whistles stripped from the WAD file and everything replaced by simple outlines and so on. And while it's not pretty, I was pretty confident that I could get it working as it's only 250 kilobytes of storage down from 14 megabytes. Now, in addition to that, a lot of stuff on the Chocolate Doom port itself had to be changed. And so, for example, I had to rip out all the file handling and add a custom file handler. I had to add support for the Game & Watch LCD, button import support, and I also had to get rid of a lot of things to get it uh, running somewhat smoothly. And so, for example, the infamous wipe effect had to go, and I also had to remove sound support. Now, the next issue was that once it was compiling, it simply would not fit into RAM and crash all the time. Now on the device, we have roughly 1.3 megabytes of RAM in different RAM areas. And for example, just the frame buffer that we obviously need takes up 154 kilobytes of that. Then we have 160 kilobytes of initialized data, 320 kilobytes of uninitialized data, and a ton of dynamic allocations that are done by Chocolate Doom. And these dynamic allocations were a huge issue because the Chocolate Doom source code does a lot of small allocations which are only used for temporary data. And so they get freed again and so on. And so your dynamic memory gets very, very fragmented very quickly. And so eventually there's just not enough space to, for example, initialize the level. And so to fix this, I took the Chocolate Doom code and I changed a lot of the dynamic allocations to static allocations, which also had the big advantage of making the error messages by the compiler much more meaningful because it would actually tell you, hey, this and this data does not fit into RAM. And eventually after a lot of trial and error and copying as many of the original assets as possible into the minimal iWatt, I got it. I had Doom running on the Nintendo Game & Watch Super Mario Brothers, and I hopefully calmed the internet gods that forced me to do it. Now, unfortunately, the USB port is physically not connected to the processor, and so it will not be possible to hack the device simply by plugging it into your computer. However, it's relatively simple to do this using one of these USB debuggers.
Now, the most requested type of homebrew software was obviously emulators. And I'm proud to say that by now we actually have kind of a large collection of emulators running on the Nintendo Game & Watch. And it all started with Conrad Beckman discovering the RetroGo project, which is an emulator collection for a device called the Odroid Go. And the Odroid Go is a small handheld with similar input and size constraints as the Nintendo Game & Watch. And so it's kind of cool to port this over because it, it basically already did all of the hard work, so to say. And um, RetroGo comes with emulators for the NES, for the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color, and even for the Sega Master System and the Sega Game Gear. And after a couple of days, Conrad actually was able to show off his NES emulator running Zelda and other games such as Contra and so on on the Nintendo Game & Watch. This is super fun and initially we only had really a basic emulator that you know could barely play and we had a lot of frame drops, we didn't have nice scaling, V-Sync and so on. But now after a couple of weeks it's really a nice device to use and to play with. And so we also have a Game Boy emulator running and so you can play your favorite Game Boy games such as Pokemon, Super Mario Land and so on on the Nintendo Game & Watch if you own the corresponding ROM backups. And we also experimented with different scaling algorithms to make the most out of the screen and so you can basically change the scaling algorithm that is used for the display depending on what you prefer and you could even change the palette for the different games. We also have a nice uh, game chooser menu where, which allows you to basically have multiple ROMs on the device that you can switch uh, between. We have safe state support and so you, if you turn off the device it will save wherever you left off and you can even come back to your save game once the battery run out. You can find the source code for all of that on uh, the RetroGo repository from Conrad and it's really really awesome. Other people build, for example, emulators for the Chip 8 system. And so uh, the Chip 8 emulator comes with a nice collection of small arcade games and so on. And it's really fun um, and really easy to develop for. And so uh, really give this a try if you own a game and watch and want to try homebrew on it. Team Schürwegen is even working on an emulator for the original game and watch games. And so this is really cool because it basically turns the Nintendo Game & Watch into an emulator for all Game & Watch games that were ever released. And what was really amazing to me is how the community came together. And so we were pretty open about the progress on Twitter. And also Conrad was Twitch streaming a lot of the process. And we opened up a Discord where people could join who were interested in, in hacking on the device. And it was amazing to see what came out of the community. And so for example, we now have a working storage upgrade that works both with Homebrew but also with the original firmware. And so instead of one megabyte of storage, you can have 60 megabytes of flash and you just need to, to replace a single chip, which is pretty uh, easy to do. Then for understanding the full hardware, Daniel Cuthbert and Daniel Padilla provided us with high resolution X-ray images, which allowed us to fully understand every single connection, even of the BGA parts without desoldering anything. Then Jake Little of Upcycle Electronics traced on the x-rays and also using a multimeter every last trace on the PCB. And he even created a schematic of the device which gives you all the details you need when you want to program something or so and was really, really fun. Sander Vandervel, for example, even created a custom backplate and now there are even project that, projects that try to replace the original PCB with a custom PCB, with an FPGA and an ESP32. And so uh, it's really exciting to see what people come up with. Now, I hope you enjoyed this talk and I hope to see you on our Discord if you want to join the fun. And thank you for coming.